good. You got water there if you need it. Ladies and gentlemen, for the last time until November of 2024, you will hear me request, please find your cell phones and silence them. Cell phones, please. Thank you very much. Okay, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the U.S. Freedom Pavilion, the Boeing Center at the National World War II Museum for the closing session of the 16th International Conference on World War II. As you can obviously see, we've decided to leave the Madeline and Paul Hilliard Conference Center at the Higgins Hotel, which has just been a wonderful venue for us for the last few days, so that we can have this closing session on Masters of the Air under our own warbirds, including, of course, our B-17 My Gal Sal. So I would like to uh, end the conference as we began it. And that is, of course, to recognize those members of the World War II generation that are here with us tonight. So please join me again in recognizing Paul Hilliard and George McAlpin. <laughs> Paul, it was wonderful to start our day off today to hear from you and, and Rob Satino, and as we've said many times, thank you for everything you and Madeline do on behalf of the museum. And uh, George, thank you again. It was very special to have you here on your big 100th birthday here at the National World War II Museum at this conference. So we'll see you next year for 101. I'd also like to acknowledge all of our speakers who have come to share their time and talents with us over the course of the conference. Please give them a warm round of applause for just the magnificent job they have done. Thank you. It's truly been a remarkable three days. And thank you again to Nick Mueller and our conference planning committee members for putting together just such a magnificent program. I think every year we say this, but it, they just keep getting better. And I want to give a, a special shout out to two people that I know are watching the live stream tonight, and that are two members of that committee that are not here this year, Rich Frank and John Morrow. So uh, thank you, and we'll see you next year, gentlemen. And importantly, I, I do want to take a, a minute here as we close this, this uh, conference out to thank the members of the museum staff who worked tirelessly to bring this event together. And I think uh, Dr. McCoy said it best today, there's lots of unseen work that goes into putting uh, an event like this together, and there are so many of our team who are involved in making the conference happen. This is one of our anchor programs of the year, and it's a testament to their dedication and professionalism. So our events team, our food and beverage team, our folks in facilities, audiovisual, security, all of the folks that helped put this together tonight, give them a round of applause. <laughs> and of course, uh, everything takes money and resources, and I want to acknowledge the work of our institutional advancement team for the great work they did securing sponsorships for this our travel and conference team who have been integral to the success of this event since the very beginning, and last but not least, of course, our team in the Jenny Craig Institute for the Study of War and Democracy. This is one of their big weeks. This is one of the big programs of the Institute, so my thanks to all of them, and in particular, Dr. Mike Bell, who leads the Institute, Jeremy Collins, who you all know is an integral part of making all of this happen and has been involved since the beginning and Connie Gentry. So let's give them a round of applause too. Thank you. Yeah. 
and as we said several times throughout the week, um, we are we owe a, a, a great debt of gratitude to the Pritzker Foundation, Pritzker Military Foundation, on behalf of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library. I want to thank Colonel Jennifer Pritzker, Susan Rifkin, and everyone at the PMML for their support over the last 13 years. It has been a huge part of making this event a success. So let's give them a round of applause, too. So now, on to tonight's uh, program. We are very excited, and I know you are too, about the upcoming release of the Apple TV Plus series, Masters of the Air, which begins airing on January 26th. And I, of course, you all know that Masters of the Air is based on the book of the same name, written by one of our closest and longest serving advisors and friends, Dr. Don Miller. Don has generously lent his time and expertise to the museum over many, many years. He is a founding member of our presidential counselors, a member of the conference planning committee, as I've said. He's been a featured historian on travel programs, teacher training sessions, and, and much, much more. Um, and I just want to take a, a, a moment of personal privilege here and depart a little bit from my script, because Don, I, I thought about uh, a couple of weeks that you and I had together back in 2005. Um, so my first trip with the museum was with Don in 2005. Uh, Jeremy Collins was on that trip as well. I think our official titles were luggage handlers for Dr. Miller. Um, and that might be being generous, actually. So, uh, But the reason I bring this trip up is it does, in a roundabout way, have a connection to tonight because Don was finishing, finishing up writing Masters of the Air yeah. on that trip. And we had some amazing veterans on that trip, Dr. Hal Baumgarten, Bill Bowl, and a gentleman that we all came to know on that trip by the name of Glenn Jostad, mm -hmm. someone who actually spoke at this conference in 2010. Glenn was a radio operator in the 452nd Bomb Group. Um, he was shot down February 14th. Uh, he spent 15 months in five POW camps. Um, and I'll never forget the moment when we're driving through, we're leaving Normandy, we're on the bus, and I think Don did a masterful job of getting Glenn to talk about his experiences to a group for the first time. And if you pay attention when you go back and reread Masters of the Year, you'll actually see Glenn in there a, a couple of times. And it was just a magnificent trip and if you haven't already gone to the Liberation Pavilion in the Cost of Victory Gallery, the second gallery as you go in, there's an oral history listening station, and you can actually listen to Glenn talking about his experiences as a POW. So um, a fantastic trip, and it took me back to those, those memories 18 years ago when you were working on the book. Um, and I want to give also a special shout out to uh, a conference guest who was with us on that trip. Where's Don Leslie? I know he's here. Uh, somewhere, yeah, yeah, but Don was with us on that trip and has also been a, a frequent uh, visitor to the conference. So, back to business, I apologize. Um, second member of our, our panel tonight, the co-producer of Masters of the Air, is Kirk Sadusky. And along with Don, Kirk, as a member of our presidential counselors, uh, was executive in charge of the HBO miniseries Band of Brothers, of course, based on the book written by museum founder Stephen Ambrose. He was also a co-producer of the HBO miniseries, The Pacific. The companion book on that was written by Dr. Ambrose's late son, Hugh Ambrose. We have been extremely fortunate to have both Kirk and Don involved with the museum, providing invaluable advice and guidance over the years, and we're very grateful to have them here with us tonight as we close out the conference. But before we hear from them directly, please enjoy the latest trailer from Apple TV Plus that was just released this week. Thank you. So you are happy? A girl worth writing to is hard to find. Not if you know where to look. I miss you every second. Major Egan, you were the first pilot assigned to the 100th. Me and Buck Clever. You are in charge of 35 planes and 350 air crewmen. 
Thought you'd die on me before I get over there. Something big is brewing. The Eighth will be sending off the largest air armada ever assembled in the history of mankind. Straight into Hitler's territory. We need complete and total air superiority. That's the mission. What? Might be the last pretty face I ever see. guide the men who fly through the great spaces of the sky. Are we Tuskegee men or what? Sir, yes, sir! Be with them traversing the air in darkening storms or sunshine fair. I think we may be done. We are going to sit here and take it. We're going to stick with our mission as long as we can fly. We won't go without a fight. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a there's a line in the fir after the fir the big conclusion of that first scene between Clever and Egan, and Clever says to Egan, "This is it. Well, this is it, pal. This is it. Yeah. Yeah. We've been working on this for over ten years, and I know the 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 theme is the making of Masters of the Air. We can't talk about the making of Masters of the Air without talking about the writing of Masters of the Air, and." I'll get into why we chose Don's book and all of that, but I, I'm very curious, and you and I have spoken about it many times, including earlier today. But tell us, why did you write Masters of the Year? What, what, what prompted you? Well, um, I'm not a trained military historian. I was a philosophy major as an undergraduate, and, and uh, in graduate school I became interested in what's called intellectual history, and my first books were about cities and depression, Great Depression. And I didn't get around to military history until the fifth book, and that was shortly after my father died, and I, I really felt a lot of guilt uh, that I had never did his war. He served with the Eighth Air Force, and, uh, and I grew up in a military family. Uh, everybody in our neighborhood, everybody, all the men, uh, every single person on our block served in the war. And, uh, Memorial Day, Flag Day was a big day. Go up to the cemetery, send the 21 gun salute, and things like that. So um, I, I had to do it. So I, I started out with uh, a, a book called The Story of World War II. I thought I'd learn about World War II by writing about it. And then I did a book on the Pacific and then looking for another topic. And what really pulled me about the war was the combat experience and how people hold up under tremendous stress the stress of aerial, aerial combat, ground combat, naval combat. To get into the book, to get into the door, into my book, you had to have been at the, at the, at the uh, uh, point of the spear in combat. And that meant civilians under the bombs. Uh, and as you know, there were more civilian, there were more non-combatants killed in World War II by far than combatants. And uh, I came across a book, um, I'll make this short, I came across a book by an Air Force psychologist and uh, Gingrich. And uh, it, it's not the kind of book a layman would read. It's a big tome, about 500 pages. And it's a series of case studies yeah. uh, by an Air Force combat surgeon who flew with the crews and treated them for what was called combat fatigue or post-traumatic stress disorder. How did they break down? Why did they break down? How do we treat them? Can we cure them? Did we cure them? It's a series of case studies. And it was absolutely enthralling reading that thing one after the other. And then I came across some numbers, you know, that the 8th Air Force had lost 26,000, this is an outfit of 280,000 total in the war. They lost 26,000 killed and uh, 28,000 prisoners of war. 
Now put that number 26,000 against this. The Marine Corps in the entire war in the Pacific lost 18,500 men from Guadalcanal to Okinawa. And the small bombings for peacetime for casualties. Your chances of surviving in, in these early missions were one in five. Uh, if you got to literally the sixth mission, you had uh, about statistically a 0% chance of surviving. 77% of the men who flew with the eighth were casualties. So I thought, this is unbelievable. And uh, so that's, that launched it really, and then meeting the veterans, um, going down to Savannah to the 8th Air Force Museum to a reunion, and meeting some really, really great guys, and finding that they were real human beings as well. And it, we, we haven't talked about this, Kirk. Uh, we haven't talked about anything up here pretty much but, um, the, uh, today. Um, but um, I met this guy named Louis Lovsky. Somebody recommended him. And uh, Lou was a POW during the war, a Jewish fella, tough guy. Uh, from a real tough area of, of uh, Camden. Uh, Camden's a tough place. I once told a cabbie that my granddaughter taught in Camden, and he said, I live there. Is your granddaughter a missionary? I said, no, she's not, <laughs> she's not a missionary. But uh, little Lou comes bounding in the room. He weighed about 125 pounds. He was about five foot four. And I'd never met him in my life and told him what I was doing. And he said, I could do 100 push-ups. I said, that's great. And uh, so... <laughs> Down on the floor he went, and I don't know how many he did, but he did a lot of them. And then he told me this amazing story, which shows you that these guys had a human side and a sense of humor and, and a humanity about them that it wasn't all, he wasn't there to just to tell me grim stories about combat. And I said, well, let's talk about your first mission because that was your last mission. He said, yeah, I got shot down on my first mission. I was a navigator. And you're coming down in the parachute over Berlin, and you're a Jewish kid. And you have a dog tag that has an H on it for Hebrew. He said, yeah, that was a big decision whether I was going to throw the dog tag away because if I have an H on it, um, I, I could be in a lot of trouble. If I filed it down and I did have a, a file, I could have a pocket file, I could have done that. But then if I'm caught trying to evade the German uh, air police, uh, I'll be shot as a spy. Uh, so he kept the H on there. He said, but that wasn't my major concern. And I said, well, what was your major concern? He said, I, you know, I was really worried about my mother. I said, well, what about your mother? He said, well, when you're hit in a plane, the minute you're hit and reported lost, whether you're killed or not, they strip your bed, they strip your locker, and they send everything home. And I had in that locker something I had bought before I came over here. Uh, I, I, I bought some contraceptives. And, and, and he, he said, and, and he, he called it a, a gross of rubbers. I said, oh, a gross of rubbers. I, I said, okay, you, you, you were worried that they were gonna go in the chest and your mother was gonna open it up and say, I raised a sex maniac. And, uh, so, yeah, he said, that's what I was worried about primarily, but I thought maybe the guys back in the barracks would find them and, uh, and remove them from the thing, which they eventually did, but Lou didn't find out until he got to the Stala, and a couple of the guys gave him one of these, you know, they, 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 they had taken the thing out. And I said to him when, they, I, I said, uh, that many, contra that many contraceptives, I said, man, you, you must have been sexually alive he said, no, I was a virgin, but I was very hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> well, well. <laughs> Lou <Anyway>, loves me. <laughs> how am I going to follow Lou? I don't, I don't know. Okay. Um, so, as I said, we've been working on this for quite a while, over a decade. And initially, we were working with HBO, as, as Stephen uh, said and as the title suggested. We played to the company I work for. That produced Band of Brothers and then produced The Pacific. And HBO came to us, who uh, made Band of Brothers and Pacific both on HBO, and said, you know, we want to do another one. We want to do another World War II limited series. And we knew we had done, we had done the paratroops, we had done the Marines, and we knew, we thought, okay, well, that leaves the Navy and it leaves the Air Force. How are we going to do that? How do we make that choice? 
And then for, a, for a, a, a minute, we dreamed and thought somehow we could combine them. And I remember talking to you about that in those early days. And of course, that was impractical. There was no way you could dramatically do justice to either story, nor afford to do it. Uh, and we were, I, we at Plato were familiar with your, with your book. And so after reading it closely, it became very apparent that this is, this is the story. If we're going to do the story of the war in the air, the Don's Masters of the Air was, was the way to go. Because as he was just saying, not only is there that kind of human detail that, that makes up stories, but Don created and has created an entire world that you get a sense of what it was like to be on a base, what it was like to be, to be in a B-17, what it was like to be under, a B under bombardment by a B-17. So that's what we, we were so attracted to was this, the overall, that there were individual stories, but in this wider world that had never, and as you make, you make it so clear in the beginning of your book, this is a form of combat that had never happened before and probably will never happen again. It was a unique experience. So how, do, how, did, how did we, how did America respond to that institutionally in terms of the Air Force? And how did primary men um, respond to that individually? And that's what Don does constantly throughout the book. You, you open your, and when, but he, this is a history of the 8th Air Force during World War II. That's an enormous subject. So how do you narrow it down? How do you find and, and, and tell a, 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 a cohesive, coherent story that just doesn't ramble all over the place? So we, very quickly, you open your book with talking about two characters, essentially. John Egan and Gail Clevin. John Egan and Gail Clevin. And when we read Masters of the Air, and he literally opens his book with, essentially with John Egan in London. We read that story, in your, first your first part of your first chapter is about the 100th bomb group. And we knew that we had our version of Easy Company in, in, in the 100th bomb group. A group of guys who didn't know each other before the war wouldn't have occasioned a cup of coffee at the beginning of the war. And this is certainly true of Clevin and Egan, yeah. and would have died for each other at the end of the war. Right. Um, why did you choose uh, Gail Clevin and John Egan to, to so, focus so closely on? Well, um, the thing that kept the crews together was love. I, I don't think you can fight a war without love. The, um, the love that comrades have for one another, um, especially you know, in the foxhole. And uh, they have that kind of strong relationship. And they were true leaders, and men under stress needed that sort of thing. Uh, bomber pilots are very different from fighter pilots, and they're picked to be different. Fighter pilots for their craziness and their risks, and think of Chuck Yeager, and a bomber pilot for their steadiness and their commanding presence, their measured personalities. And they have a whole crew to take care of, not just the Germans. They got to keep that crew together under tremendous stress. And I knew that the men at the 100th Bomb Group, from reading some accounts, just worshipped these guys. And uh, I thought it'd be interesting to tell their story because there was a juxtaposition there that didn't work. They were totally unalike. And uh, uh, Clevin didn't like athletics. He didn't like baseball. Uh, he didn't drink. Uh, he didn't carouse. He was a one-woman man. He had a girlfriend back home. And Egan was exactly the opposite. He was in the bars every night raising royal hell. You refer to him as a, Damon, a character out of Damon Runyon. Yeah, he is a character out of Damon Runyon, and he read all the Damon Runyon works, and even tried to talk that smart Alec Fifth Avenue, Damon was that smart Alec Fifth Avenue uh, accent. But totally different guys, and yet they bonded so closely together. And also, you know, and we're a little bit ahead, they, they both get shot down at just about the same time. And uh, in fact, when I opened the book, Egan is in London on leave. He'd just gone through an absolutely catastrophic mission, harrowing mission. And um, he goes out to buy a newspaper after breakfast, and he reads that the 100th had hammered uh, Bremen. But then he sees that you know, like 40 forts were lost. So he calls, goes to a, a little red booth, 
and he calls in in code and he says, did we have a game yesterday? And uh, Red Bowman, the operation officer said, yeah, how did we do? He said, we didn't do too good. Uh, how many guys did we lose? We, we lost a lot of guys. What about the big, the big hitters? What about the big, they're all gone. They're all gone. Uh, are we gonna do it again? He said, yeah, there's another game tomorrow. And then Egan says, I'm pitching. I'm pitching. And he goes back to the base and he flies with a raid against Munster that becomes a, um, a revenge raid. And uh, we'll talk about that raid in a second. And on that raid too was a character named Robert Rosie Rosenthal who drew me in and he was the guy I most respected. Uh, I could talk in a second about, uh, well, I'll give you just a quick biography of Rosenthal. Uh, Jewish kid from um, Flatbush, loved the Dodgers, uh, poor family, um, didn't go to synagogue, he loved jazz music, and uh, went down to New York City to, to the record shops. He's an all-American athlete, Brooklyn College, had a terrific football and baseball team. He's in their Hall of Fame in both sports. Went to law school, aced it out, got the best job of anybody in his law school class, and was sitting at his desk when, um, you know, there's rumblings that the Japanese might hit somewhere in the Pacific. Then Pearl Harbor weekend. On Monday, he's at the recruiting station, signs up, goes over and, Usually these bomb groups went as a group, the 100th went as a group, so he joins them as an outlander. He's a, he's a replacement, so he has to work himself into this thing. And uh, when he gets there, he quickly rises to the top because he's very disciplined, uh, very cool under pressure, and a, uh, a fantastic leader of human beings, but not boastful in that sort of way. He flies um, 25 missions and decides to re-up he says he's not re-upping because, uh, he, because he's Jewish. He knew about the camps. He said, I'm re-upping because of Hitler. Uh, he's a barbarian. And as long as he, he's running that country, I'm flying my plane. And he goes for another 25 and then tries to go for another 25. He's shot down, captured by the Russians of all people, taken to Moscow, dinner with Abraham Aram, tried to get back in the war. He wanted to serve in the Pacific. They sent him back home. He went back to his old law office and he said, I am bored to shit here. And compared to the war, this is, this is a job, the supreme job of my life. And, 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 and it's just shuffling papers. So he reads about the Nuremberg trials and they need trial lawyers. He signs up. He boards a ship for, for Germany. He meets a young Navy uh, lawyer, uh, Phyllis and a hellier, and they fall in love. Rosie said, well, I didn't know whether I was in love or I was seasick, but it was really working. <laughs> and, uh, and they both prosecuted, they prosecuted, uh, Phyllis prosecuted um, the, uh, the prisoners. Well, she prosecuted the Nazis who persecuted the, the prisoners that ran the, uh, the oil and chemical plants in, uh, in Austria and Hungary. And, and just a horrible thing. Rosie helped to prosecute German civilians who had uh, committed atrocities, beheadings, you know, wiring guys' hands behind their back and throwing them into the fiery buildings that they just bombed. He prosecuted them. He interviewed Keitel. He interviewed Yodel. He interviewed all the Nazis. And, and he uh, interviewed Hermann Goering. He interviewed Ironic Hermann Goering before well, well, suicide. Let's, let's, for a suicide, and he wanted to go to the hangings. Uh, he thought that would be closure, and he said, when I, but it wasn't the hanging. He said, when I saw these trumped up, you know, barbarians, uh, reduced to ciphers, uh, in prison clothing, depressed, red-eyed, sputum coming out of the side of their mouth when they know they're gonna be hanged, when I saw that, it, it, it was closure for me. Phyllis was pregnant, and we had to go home, and the trials were over. And he told me that story when I first met him. Uh, I had to pull it out of him. He never wrote about it. But uh, well, Don, well, Don, let's. Um, I had a character there. <laughs> that you you certainly did. You had a hell of a character there, and I think that's what really once we decided 
that it was Don's book, and then more specifically the hundredth, then which characters in the hundredth, and as Don has just described, it becomes, it becomes very obvious very clearly. Initially, it's, it's Egan and Clevin, and if anyone's familiar with Greek mythology, they, they pretty much, they reminded us of Plato, of the Damon and, the, the, <laughs> the most iconic uh, friendship in Greek mythology, Damon and Pythias. They really are very much like that. But then we knew that, that we wanted it to be more than just the story of these two guys and the friendship. It had to be a little bit wider. So who else could we focus on? And Don just told you it was Robert Rosie Rosenthal. Because if they were, if Clevin and Egan or Damon and Pythias, Rosie was Sir Galahad, the perfect knight, the perfect airman, the perfect warrior. Um, so Don gave us these characters. He gave us this world. And then, of course, we have to do it. Um, in the, the clip you saw and in the show, Major Cle Gail Clevin is played by Austin Butler, which you saw, and Major Egan is played by Callum Turner, who will be in a movie that's coming out in just a couple weeks, Boys in the Boat. He's the star of, and I think you're going to get to, you'll see a lot of Callum. And then Rosie is, is portrayed by Nate Mann, who... Who's terrific. It, who's terrific. Um, you, we... In Band of Brothers and the Pacific, we got to know, I got to know, Plato, Gary, and Tom got to know um, a lot of the men that we portrayed. Certainly in Band of Brothers, there were dozens of them, from Major Winters to Bill, Sergeant Garnier and, and, and Lieutenant Lipton. And then the Pacific, we got to know quite a number of the guys as well. Unfortunately, in Masters of the Air, none of the men that we portray survived, uh, survived uh, lived. So we never got to meet them. We did meet some members of the 100th who knew them, but we didn't get to meet them. So it took a lot of research. Who were these guys? And, and I know getting to know, we've worked very closely with all of the families, the, 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 the Rosenthal family, the, the Crosby family, Harry Crosby, who's an, our, our fourth leading character. And uh, to go back to Rosie for a minute, we, you, you, when you hear about him, when you talk to his family, when you read about him, when you talk about, when you talk to the men who who served with him, you realize what an extraordinary man he was. And Nate, who I, we all say we we got the yep we got the opportunity. We shot the uh, entire show in in England, and at one point, uh, Dan Rosenthal brought his son Sam over. Dan is a, it was Rosie's son, and, and brought brought Sam over, and we were able to introduce him to Nate. And you could immediately see, you could see that Dan recognized something in Nate that was with, with, with innate in, in, in his father. Um, you came over to England for a while. You yeah. came over and, and, and spent some time. We, we, it, we were in England for, I want to say, about nine months shooting this on, on, on I, we had four primary big locations. Each location was almost the size of a small municipal airport. It was a very complex production, and we were doing it in 2021. So you know what that means. We were in the middle of COVID, and that complicated things in a way that the other, the other productions we didn't, have to, we didn't have to worry about as much. Um, you know, the sets were staggering. When I heard that Steven had, Spielberg had was going to create a, uh, a barracks of, uh, from the Stalag, Stalag Luft III, which is in Sagen in, in what was then Germany. And that was where our airmen were uh, <laughs> positioned for the rest of the war after they were shot down. I thought one barracks, but it was an entire camp. And I thought, my God. And then I went over to Oxford and I saw at Abington and in the hundreds of stations at a place called Thorpe Abbott, it's a bomber base. 2,500 people in the base, intermixed with locals and farm people working their lands while the planes are flying. And uh, you guys had recreated Thorpe Abbott's. Well, I look, I, you know, I, I will say one of the interesting, and you know, one of the reasons that I think hopefully this series works is the devotion to detail that everyone on the production paid. You saw it. We, um, one of the best days that we had was Thorpe Abbott's is currently at the, the, the air base that the, that the 100th flew out of is currently a, a museum in East Anglia. And we got to know the, and it's 
all run by lo uh, locals, it's volunteers. And it's obviously a work of love for them. And one day we were able to uh, bring De Deborah Hubbard, who yeah. runs the museum, and her staff, some of whom have worked there for, since the war, yeah. since they, they created the museum. And to have them come in and see the briefing room, the Nissan huts, and one gentleman, Ron Batley, who grew up in Thorpe Abbotts, broke down because it was so authentic. And that's, that's it's in many ways, is the key. It, it was one of the keys, there's no one key. But the art department run by uh, our, our production designer, Chris Seegers, and the, the, war, the costume department and our costume designer, Colleen Atwood, the, the devote on, on, um, on the tail of, of uh, B-17s in the 100th bomb group is a big D. The 100th is the big D. Well, the big D in our production is devotion. Devotion to detail, because it was from top to bottom, whether you were the department head or you were a seamstress, you were a department head, a prop master, a PA. The devotion to tell this story correctly was absolute. And I think, I think you will see that on the screen. And I well, think that's what I worried about at first. You always worry, is your film going to be Hollywoodized and things like that? I had had a couple of conversations with Dave McCullough, who's a very close friend for years. And, and these guys had done, and Kurt was largely responsible for getting David to do this, the John Adams series. And uh, David said, they're the best, they get it right. And I remember our first meeting with Tom Hanks, and he kept saying, fidelity, fidelity, everything has to be exactly as it happens. No composite character. Every character has to be the character, you know, from real life. The names are the same. Everything that happens in that film has to have happened, and it happened in the way that we portray it. If we're not going to do a film like this, a film kind of like Das Boat, then we shouldn't be working on this film. And, uh, and, and he threw himself into this thing. Uh, quick, quick anecdote, he, to show you the kind of dedication that everybody had. Kurt was amazing. I think I used to refer to Kurt as a historian. Um, he knew as much about the hundreds as anybody went by the time it was done. But Tom flew into, I live in a little town called Easton, Pennsylvania, uh, 35,000 people in you know, Delaware River. And Tom flew in one day, we were going to work at my house, and um, the, um, it drove my wife crazy, you bring it, Tom Hanks here, holy mm. shit. That's, yeah, okay. Uh, <coughs> we got to buy this, we got to buy that. But uh, anyway, I... So we, we pick him up at the airport. I said, Tom, you're only staying like for three, a couple days. He's got a couple of suitcases. He said, they're filled with books. I said, what are the books? He said, the latest books on German history. You know, he says, there's all kinds of fantastic historians, you know, writing tremendous books about Hitler. And I want to read them all. Plus, he said, I have 245 note cards that we're going to go over this weekend. I said, oh my God. Yeah, <laughs> but that was... That was the kind of dedication that. Well, that well he Tom, had. Tom's de uh, his devotion, obviously, to World War II is, is, I mean, and to this museum is well known. I, I, I think I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the other people involved with the show as well. I want to start with Gary Getzman, who is Tom's partner and has been his partner through Band of Brothers, and through the Pacific, and everything Platon has ever done. They're, and I, you, you saw and have seen firsthand, I will say, and this is, I, I'm prejudiced, of course, this has to be the most difficult production. I can't imagine the scale and scope of this thing. I'm not kidding when I say four municip small municipal airports with many satellite locations, the logistics of this thing. And then we're still in post-production, even though it's about to, it's going to stream in, in a month and a half. We're still futzing with it. And, 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 and Gary has really been, and again, you've mentioned it to me, has really been, he's, ha he's the Hap Arnold, the yeah. head of the 8th, uh, not the 8th Air Force, the entire Air Force. He's the Hap Arnold of, of, of this project. He's Ahab after the whale, man. He's, <laughs> he, he's gone. Oh, unfortunately, I, well, not fortunately, I, 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 I think we're going to catch this one now. Yeah. Um, and, but there are so many people. And again, I want to like to mention John Orloff, who was our primary screenwriter. And when John, we, we 
uh, Plato knew John very well. He, he wrote a couple of the episodes of Band of Brothers. And he, when we invited him to come and, and, and join us, he threw himself into this completely. One of the things about uh, adapting Don's book is that there's no one story. As I said, that's the great thing about the book. It's an, it's an entire, you're presented with an entire world. John's challenge was to figure out, but we have to adapt it so that it's, like I said, it's a, it's a co dramatically coherent. You can't just go, every, it, we can't portray everything. And John threw himself in and, and did the research and came up with and helped the, 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 the character, the, the Egan, Clevin, Rosenthal, who we didn't get to meet, unlike Winters and some of the other guys. John had to envision envisioned dramatically and he worked for I think almost a year right? Yes. on just doing the research and putting it up and just put, and putting that together Don worked very closely with John at, um, he called me you know and we talked for eight nine hours and uh, just about Gail Clavin because it, it, it was serendipitous but it just so happened that I was the only person on the whole project that had met these guys Right. So everyone's coming to well, me. Let's, and, let's, let's what's, talk. What, what's this guy like? You know, and it, it, you know, I had to draw these mental kind of pictures and things. Well, well, because you're the only one who's met them, let's talk about them a little bit, and and, and throw and Harry Crosby too, because we have a a, a very important fourth member of um, who's in in all of our episodes. When we meet him, he's Lieutenant Crosby. He ends up as a lieutenant colonel, and he was a navigator, and. He was the one character that we have who was at Thorpe Abbott's from the beginning yeah. in 19, they, uh, our, our guy, the 100th was formed in, at Thorpe Abbott's in May, June of 1943. Harry Crosby was there from the beginning all the way through May 1945 right. in VE Day. You met Harry Crosby. Yeah. Tell us, and you'll, you'll, you'll get to know Anthony Boyle plays, uh, a wonderful Irish actor plays, um, uh, Harry Crosby and does a, a spectacular job. Well, these airmen were wonderfully talented human beings. I mean, Gail Clevin went on to get a PhD in astrophysics and became a college president. Uh, and he's just a roustabout from Montana, but an alcoholic father. Uh, they're interesting kinds of characters. Harry was um, bubbly, excitable, um, inefficient at first, scared out of his wits, worried about his incompetence, and slowly as the film evolves, you see him coming into himself. Uh, he falls in love briefly, uh, and he has a wife back home, but he falls in love with this English girl. He gets to become a lead navigator, a tremendously responsible position, uh, getting the bombers to the target so they can do the bombing and uh, worked himself into such a tizzy before D-Day that he passed out and slept for three days. Yeah, Don't just, give it all away. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Harry had a sense of humor. And his book, A Wing and a Prayer, is, is terrific. And it, it gets you into the internalities of what it's like to be on a bomber base, which is a community that's integrated with the villagers. And, um, and they're part of the story. Uh, in the film and in my book, as are uh, the people in London and the Germans under the bombs. Uh, when I would, you, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Don. But, but when you do something, when you undertake a project like this, you can't just, the, this happened and that happened. There has to be some, again, some thematic consistency. And what, there, I think there were two primary themes uh, in, our, in our series. And one Don has already touched on. It's the irony that war is impossible without love. And what that means, of course, is that the men, and you hear this time and time again, whether you're talking to somebody from the 1st Marine Division or Easy Company or on, on a destroyer in the Pacific. Why do they do it? They do it for each other. Ultimately, at the end of the day, they do it for each other. War is impossible without the love of men for each other thrown into those circumstances. The other theme, I, I think, and we've talked about this a lot, is how did those men keep getting back into those planes? After you've been on a mission, after you've seen Regensburg, and after you've bombed Regensburg, and Munster, and Bremen, and et cetera, 
How do you get back in that plane? And yet they did, time and time again. Exactly. I, I wanted to get away from this bullshit that this is push-button warfare. You're just up there, you don't see the victims, you press a button, you bomb people, and that's very different from infantry. Most of these airmen would, to, would talk to infantrymen. My uncle was with the first division, landed in the first two minutes of D-Day with a big red one. And as I said, my father was in the Air Force and my uncle flew with LeMay on the, the fire raids. But the infantrymen were always awed by the bombers, flying up there with all that gasoline in a thin little tube that if you had a, a, a strong arm and a screwdriver, you could drive a hole right through the, uh, the outer fuselage of the plane, the skin of the plane, so the flak comes right through. And what we wanted to do is take you in this film inside the plane, not do dog fights and things like that on the outside, you know, kind of a, 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 a different kind of like Tom Cruise film. And, and all you have to do is, I had written about these missions and I knew they were Howie, but when you see them reproduced, I, I remember the first time I saw Jaws and jumped out of the seat. I jumped out of the seat in this thing. The panic and fury and chaos that takes place. In, this is not 10 guys inside a plane and they've been hit. Take a typically two engines knocked out, maybe three engines knocked out, four, two gunners, three gunners may be out. The pilot's been decapitated. No medics on the plane, no foxholes in the sky. Where do you go? Do you go to tend to your comrades? All you have with some morphine. Shoot them with morphine. Put them on the cold floor of the plane. Get a blanket over them. If they're too banged up, wrap them in a parachute, throw them out. No, wait a minute. I gotta take care of this guy over here. He's really hurt. But my best buddy's hurt too. But he's hurt worse. Who do I go? Yeah, they both have sucking wounds. If I pull the pressure back, they die. And all the time the plane is shaking like hell. And there's a smell of piss and shit and cordite and everything and smoke all over the plane. And all that time, you're being hit by 125 fighter planes coming at you from every direction. And you got to man the gun and get the plane back. When you see that reproduced, it's unbelievable what they suffered. And they were so close to the Germans. The Germans came in so close, they could see the eyes of the pilots. Yeah. And I talked to some guys who fought in the Pacific and said, we never get that close to the Japanese. Uh, they could see their eyes, and they certainly saw the Germans in the, uh, in, in, in the camps. But that's what really impressed me. And a quick note on that, the cameramen had a tough time moving around inside the constricted fuselage, which is much more constricted than a submarine tube. And uh, so Spielberg built, we built two B-17s from scratch. Amazing project, 11 months, I stayed in England. And he built a third one that had a wider body, so we don't show it, that allowed the cameraman to go inside the plane and film close up the kind of things that I've described. Well, I know you're not trying to suggest that Steven Spielberg built these, crawled into these planes and built them. So you're using, obviously, Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks and Gary. There's, there's the is a symbol, <laughs> sim, sim, uh, representing the work of hundreds of people. Yeah. One of the, all these things that, what I think, again, when you tackle this kind of subject, what's gonna, what separates it from just another adventure story, just another story of combat? And I think it's providing some kind of context without being didactic about it. And that's what somebody was asking about that, me about that earlier, and that was really a big challenge. Because at the end of the day, why are these guys doing this? Why, at the end of the day, they're dropping bombs that are gonna kill women and children? There's no way around that. So why? And how do you do that without lecturing? How do you suggest that without lecturing, without, like you said, being didactic about it? Suggesting it so that it... It's a great it, point. So that it, 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 it's integrated into the themes of the, and the drama of the story without being separate from the story. Don and I could sit up here as, at, and talk about this all night because we have done it all night many times, but I have a feeling there may be a lot of questions. I just want to make one point that a lot of people here are writers and you'll know that one of the central dilemmas that we faced was how do you move the story along dramatically while building in interpretation without having the interpretation slow the narrative. Uh, that's hard to do. 
as yeah. all of you know, you know right you, you now. You don't have time history. to stop and explain who the Nazis are, what they did, why they, why they had to be beaten. You, you can't do that. You have, to keep, you have to keep going. Once you're on, once you take off, you have to keep going. Um, I think, I'm sure, we're probably, uh, I'm sure there's some questions from the audience. Jeremy, are we, yeah, are we ready to do that? Yeah, for Kurt Sadowski and Don Miller. Please raise your hands and Connie or I will get to you as quickly as we can. First question is going to be dead center all the way in the back, gentlemen. Yeah, thank you for a good presentation. What I'd like to ask is, uh, it was mentioned that a number of B-17s were scratch built for this production. How many real B-17s, if any, were used in creating this production? None. Yeah, there were no, we, we, we for numerous reasons. Uh, that was never practical, it was never considered, actually. There were three uh, B-17s that were built, that, but they didn't fly. They were rep they, there were three replicas of B-17s that were, that were built, one of which that actually could be, could propel forward, but there was never any, you, you couldn't do it. You couldn't shoot inside a, a real B-17. You wouldn't take people up and, and it was just never a, con a consideration. But again, like I said before, the devotion to recreating B, the B-17s down to the smallest detail on the, in the flight deck, in the nose, in the fuselage um, was extraordinary, I, I'll have to say. And again, that, that sense of authenticity um, was essential to everybody doing their jobs. It was inspirational, and I, so many people would say this. It was inspirational to work on the show, not just because of the, it was, it was, it was what the men deserved, to, to have that kind yeah. of, that, that kind of dedication from everyone, no matter whether you were Austin Butler or Callum Turner, or you were a set PA. To have that kind of dedication, it was the, the men deserve nothing less. I, I was sitting in a, uh, they were filming a, uh, the briefing in the uh, briefing room uh, before D-Day. Rosie gets up and explains that they're going to finally hit Omaha Beach. And there's cheering and things like that. And I was off camera, of course, in an office that had an open window that could look out onto the set. And I saw a, a stack of papers there in, in, a, in a file box. And I just went through them, and I picked up the bottom one. And it was an actual Air Force communique, and I picked up the next one. It was official Air Force business. They could have put advertisements for, you know, Campbell's Soup in there. And, and you go into the bar, and I checked the labels and everything. Absolute fidelity. Absolute, absolute, absolute accuracy. Shaving our, cream our inside, inside authenticity the Authenticity and the accuracy. razors, the shoelaces. You, you could... You, well, we would never, I would say, Playtone would never do it otherwise. It's the only way to, you can really do it. And again, to have the kind of impact that we know we have had with the other two series and hope to have with Masters of the Air. Jeremy? Raise your hands high so Connie and I can see. Gentlemen, we're going to go slightly to your left, to Joe in the red hat with Connie, please. Dr. Miller, could you talk about your father's service with the EA Air Force and how it affected him during the war and afterwards? Well, not really. Um, it, it would take us a little bit away from the story here. I'd be glad to talk to you in private about it, though. Yeah. Yeah. Don, we're going to stay with Connie in the back left. In the clip you showed us, there were scenes of firefights and dogfights and all kinds of things in the air. How were those produced? Um, again, there's, without getting into too much technical detail, I mean, for most of it, a lot of it is done post-production and, in fact, is still be a little bit being worked on in the, the visual effects. So, so much of that is, is computer-generated and created by our uh, effect, special effects supervisor Stephen Rosenbaum, who is like everyone on our, like Chris Seegers and Colleen Atwood and Steve Rosenbaum, are the absolute top of their game. 
But we also, in terms of the, the B-17s and, and the P-51s and you, um, that you, you see with the, uh, the Tuskegee guy, the uh, 332nd guys, they, we had the fuselages and they were on a gimbal and it was in, they were filmed in something called the volume, which is essentially hundreds and hundreds of, of video screens that recreate the environment outside the airplanes. And it, because they're on a gimbal, they can move. So that helps the actors So in, in terms of shooting that. But the, the primarily the dogfights, the, the air combat, depending on what part of it, particularly if anything you're in the exterior of the planes, is all done through special effects. And the B-17s that we had, we could move them around the base, uh, stationary on the base. And we even have one landing, there's one landing, the propellers worked, and they built these enormous cranes with wires on them, and you see this thing coming in, and you don't see the wires, you don't see the cranes or anything, and you see it landing, and it, look, and it is a, an actual yeah. B-17. Yes. So we tried to use it, it as, quite as an little endeavor. CGI as possible. The, yeah. the logistics, as I, as I suggest, were, 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 were enormous. Next question is to your right in the front row. Uh, Don, you know better than anyone else the controversies over the effects or the uses of air power in World War II. It's a big question, but how do you think about the contribution of air to the war? What, what, what effect did these heroic figures have on the outcome of the war? Well, there were several um, uh, bomber wars, and they had various stages. In the beginning, just to go through quickly, in the beginning, bombing was um, catastrophically ineffective. Uh, the bombs were, we were bombing uh, submarine pens in San Nazar. The bombs were bouncing off German reinforced concrete um, storage places uh, like ping pong balls. And the city was San Nazar, and they called it Flak City, and they were losing planes. That's the 12 o'clock high story about how do you keep men motivated when they're not carrying out the mission, that is, they're, they're going to the target and they're getting hammered, the bombing's ineffective, and the casualties are calamitously high. And uh, so we evolved from that in, in, in the story to the point where they're doing serious damage on the, uh, on the German economy to the point where in October of 1944, German oil production was down to 6%. That's when they learned how to hit German oil by k killing it by a thousand cuts. This idea of pinpoint bombing is an oxymoron. It doesn't exist. And you don't knock out a plant with one raid. You had to go back and hit it and hammer it again and again. Um, one particular raid, one particular plant in central Germany, an oil mill, they hit it 120 times, 120 separate strikes to knock it out. But when you were bombing out there, uh, you're not killing a lot of civilians because the spillage goes into uh, it's like the area outside New York, uh, the so-called Meadowlands, you know, and uh, it's just a mess of oil refineries and whatnot. But if you go into, when we really started to get, uh, Con Crane and I were talking about this today with Kurt, um, as we're producing a, a, a um, what, what do we call those things we're doing? We're going to keep that a secret for a moment. Oh, okay. All right. But <laughs> well, let me, can, don't, let me, we, we let take me the gloves off at some point, in other words, and, and we're, we're bombing in the center of cities because we're hitting the one target that really works and, and that is um, marshalling yards where all these trains gather together so you don't have to hit the jet production factory and the, the coal head mine site or the electrical system. It's all there. I but think, Jeremy, can I, let me interrupt yeah. for a second because and, cause we do, well, a lot of that we, we don't portray. But, no, he but was to, just asking what I thought. No, I'm sorry, Don. Oh. I, 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 oh. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, but what another area that is really germane and where the air power um, was so effective was in the build up to D Day, which, and all the time I've been with the museum and all the World War II history I've read, I never quite understood, and it was really one of your central points, was that the Eighth Air Force just doesn't get enough credit for the success of the Normandy invasion. Because for that, the, that invasion to work, there had to be really essentially no. Air, there had to be no um, complete opposition air from it's a complete air supremacy. And so for months starting in January of 44, the 8th Air Force's main target was actually the Luftwaffe. 
and the fact that there was almost no opposition from the air on any of those five beaches on D-Day is the greatest testament to their success. And but this, what this was, Germans continued to produce machines, airplanes, but they didn't have the oil because we were hammering oil and they didn't have the pilots. The pre-D-Day raids were pilot killing campaigns. They wanted to kill as many skilled German pilots as possible. And they did, they killed 76% of the Luftwaffe pilots. And they lost, and, and they did it in such a way that was crazy, they used the bombers as bait. They knew a primary target like Berlin, Hitler had to defend. And we finally had a plane that could handle every, anything the Germans could throw up except a jet, they didn't have many of those. We had a Mustang, a P-51 Mustang, faster, more nimble, and with the fuel capacity to fly ahead of the bombers all the way to Berlin, so you could escort the missions into Hungary, for that matter. And so we wanted to mess, we wanted the Germans to mess with us. So we flew these missions to bait the Germans to come up. And so the bombers flew dedicated missions. Every time they went in, they went in the same route. No diversions. Carl Spatz, who was head of the Eighth, all Air Forces in Europe, sent them in the same way. And he upped the missions from 25 to 30 and then to 35 while he's doing this. And the bomber guys knew that they were up there as bait. And, and, yeah. and they knew that they were going to kill a lot of civilians because Berlin didn't have the kind of targets that we were looking for. That this was going to be, this was going to be a different kind of bombing. And it, it you know, it, and it worked. Um, in the process of, I, 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 when I walk on the beaches of Normandy, I think 18,300 um, British and American crews and pilots were killed in the three-month three run-up to D-Day um, as against a little less than 5,000 killed on the actual D-Day. And yet you never hear this mentioned anywhere. And there, as Kurt said, there is no D-Day if the Germans are there. It's, I said it, the Armada doesn't sail unless we have air supremacy. And once we have air supremacy, now we can go after major industrial targets. And, uh, what, and what Don was talking about in terms of the, 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 the psychological attrition when they're at that period, when a lot of guys are aiming at 25 missions and all of a sudden, well, no, it's actually 30 missions. Well, you know what, on, on third thought, it's 35 missions. And they knew, as, and they weren't told, but they, they inf quickly inferred that they were being used as bait to, to bring up the, the, the German fighters. So that's the kind of psychological human dr uh, drama, dilemma, conflict that you need to you that you need to build a, a dramatic series on, so that it's not just again another adventure story. But how, what's the effect? What's and the so you got to pull these guys off the line and send them to what they call flack houses, old estates that are donated by the British aristocracy, and they can go there and you know run with the hounds or play ar archery or whatever. That didn't work. Uh, but as guys start to break down, they realize they have a mental problem of major proportions. Actually, it started in uh, North Africa when there were over 30,000 cases of combat fatigue, as it was euphemistically called. The British called it very roughly lack of moral fiber. Ooh, that's <laughs> tough one. Um, but anyway, the, um, how to treat these guys to get them to fly again is a big dilemma. Um, they're, they're working in with the doctors, and some of the doctors and the chaplains are saying, why should we fix these guys up mentally? Why should we get them right to send them up in the planes in the same conditions that brought them in here in the first place. I'm sending a guy on a second suicide run and by, by curing them. So there's that kind of dilemma. They started to use drugs like sodium amethol and sodium pentothal, which are sleep serums, and use depth psychology to try to pull the demons out of them, get them to relive the missions that were calamitous psychologically for them and that shook them to their core. And that did no good, it made them worse. The only thing that could cure a guy was to say, you don't have to fly again. Uh, but this is a real problem that, that the eighth confronts. And, that are, and we try to show it in a muted way, I think, in the film, as we watch our guys slowly, glancingly display these kinds of right. the characteristics yeah. of combat stress, which is different from the kind of stress 
that combat veterans on the ground have. It's completely different symptoms. Other questions? We'll get uh, last question in the back center, well, please, gentlemen. And Jared, can I point a privilege, and also this gentleman in the front has also had his hand up for quite a while. So let's, can we do two questions? Yes, sir. Please. The answers are... Oh, there you are. Yeah. Okay. Let's, uh, let's get two in here. Sure. First of all, I'd like to thank you. Um, I've been a teacher, and I've seen the kind of um, demise of our history in the public school system. And so one thing kids will watch is a film or uh, you know, go to movies, whatever, but if it's video, they watch it. And the fact that this is a true story. And so it is really a way to communicate with young people the hell of World War II. My question is, however, how much did this cost? <laughs> 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 we're, we, we can't say. Well, let's, let's focus. Let's on just the, say we're over budget. <laughs> well, thank you for the comment, and I, I think it's fair to say it may be the largest television production of all time. Uh, we'll leave it. At, we'll leave it at that. And we'll say it's and well worth every penny and dollar. One, one last question, please. Last question is going to be in the front right here. Thanks very much. So one of the issues with making war movies or series is the age of the actors compared to the characters they're playing. I remember yeah. Tom Hanks being a 40-year-old captain in Saving Private, uh, yeah, Saving Saving Private, Private Ryan. Ryan when that would have been 24. How, how'd you guys do in that respect, given that a lot of your... A lot of fresh-faced young actors. <laughs> uh, we try to stay away from them. Well, I think, uh, and you, we run into this in every in every one of the series. And I, one, of the, one of the considerations were that there was something about the young men of that time growing up in the Depression and then serving in the war that 24 then almost appears like, I don't want to say 34 today, but certainly older. 24 today is a little bit different because of just life experience and what was expected. And what, what people around the world, young men around the world, but in America had to do. So you end up, for a variety of reasons, casting older than the actual roles. But could be, because that's how they, when you look at archival footage of, of World War II, you're, you don't, I mean, I, you just don't think you're looking at 19 year olds, although you are. When you look at, at, at the World at War or some of the Ken Burns stuff, they, men who were 22, and there also the other thing is, we were talking about this today, the responsibility. You just, it, it, a fresh-faced 19-year-old, even though that's what they were, it's almost, I'm not sure you would buy it that that kind of responsibility could be handled by a 25-year-old. So you tend to cast a little bit older. Yeah. Uh, I just want to make one other comment uh, about... I, I was really impressed by what you said about dedication, because that's what hit me, the dedication uh, and commitment of the crew members. I'll give you one little anecdote. I was working with Tim Van Patten on the last, um, the ninth volume, if you will, of the series. And uh, his enthusiasm, uh, now this is a guy that's won Emmy after Oscar after Emmy, you know, I mean, he, he's the best there is in, in a lot of ways, he's a great actor. And, he sat me down and he said, I read your chapter on Mooseburg, which is this gigantic catch basin of a prison camp with 100,000 people in it. The Germans were moving, uh, not just the Jews, but the prisoners of war to the, to the west. And most of them were at Mooseburg, which is outside of Munich. And there is the, uh, the American infantry invades that area. There's a big firefight just outside of Mooseburg. And, and then it's spilled into Mooseburg. And then it spills into the camp itself, and there's chaos and everything else. Anyway, and Patton comes and, and liberates it. So Tim says to me, I read the chapter, but I want you to tell me about it. Now, I sat there for six and a half hours and told him every detail. He didn't take notes, but he, it was like registering. And he said, could you come back tomorrow morning pretty early? I said, well, how early? He said, like five, six o'clock. I said, 
yeah, I'll have my driver bring me back over to the main studio. So I got there, and um, his assistant said, he wants you to close your eyes and then go into that room. And uh, because he was in London shopping last night, and I went into the room, and he had models of tanks that kids play with. Tanks and flags and troops and everything, planes coming in. It was, it was like something you got for Christmas under the tree. And it was a perfect recreation mm -hmm. of the Mooseburg battle. He had done it overnight. Mm -hmm. And I said, how did he get these toys in the middle of the night in London? He said he was banging on the doors of shops <laughs> and things like that, having the shopkeeper open the toy store, let him in there, and he bought all this stuff. And, and the point, though, and I know we have to wrap up, Mike, um, is that, again, it's the dedication. Because yeah. he, the, that eye to detail, and he wanted to show it to you because he only understood it through your words. Now, yes. this is how he's interpreting it, and he wanted to see what you thought of that. Thank you, Don. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Don and Kirk, and thank you, Master for the So an incredibly special opportunity to hear from these two key figures in this behind the scenes look. I'm sure the audience will all agree. Not only are, are we more eager to see it now, but with these insights, it'll help us see it more clearly and more deeply appreciate uh, what, into, what went into making it a reality. So now as we wrap up the 16th International Conference on World War II, uh, please join me first in a, a couple thanks. Uh, first, thanks to the Pritzker Military Foundation and on behalf of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library. Let's give them a round of applause, please. <laughs> Next, uh, to all our speakers throughout the weekend, uh, you really made this incredible. Thank you. For those of you watching at home, thank you for joining us uh, uh, virtually and for those that will continue to watch this. Let's give them a round of applause as well.